Give up the fight for some other moment, some other life than here and now. Give up the longing for some other world, the wishing for other choices to make, other songs to sing, other bodies, other ages, other countries, other stakes. Purge the past, forgive the future, for each comes too soon. Surrender only to this life, this day, this hour, not because it does not constantly break your heart, but because it also beckons with beauty, startles with delight, if only we keep waking up. This is the gift we have been given, these body clothes, this heartbreak, this pulse, this breath, this light, these friends, this hope. Here we, we remember ourselves all a part of all, giving thanks together. Come, let us worship this morning. Good morning, and welcome to everyone joining us on Zoom to worship this morning. Wherever you're Zooming in from, we're glad that you are here. Whether you're a long time person, a returning person, or maybe newer to this community, welcome. We have a few announcements this morning. One announcement is regarding our children's programming. So because of the surge that we all are keenly aware of in COVID cases, and because we know we are so Zoomed out, we are not trying to hold our regular uh, faith development classes in this moment. But instead, we are inviting um, any children and youth who want to participate into worship. Um, we'll have a time for all ages this morning, and then there is an option to attend a children's chapel that will be geared towards children and youth. And so if you are wanting to join that children's chapel, or if you have a kid or a youth in your household who is wanting to do that, make sure that their Zoom name is CC before their name that will help with sorting people into the right uh, spot so they can be in that breakout room for the children's chapel this morning. And that will wrap up by 11 as well. So it should be simultaneous with the later part of our adult worship service. And this will be our pattern for this Sunday and next Sunday. And then we will have a multi-generational service on the 23rd. So that will be how we handle things for the time being. And as ever, we are always pivoting, open to feedback, and trying to do our best for our community in these times. There will be a Lyceum this afternoon on Zoom as usual at 3 p.m. Our own Rebecca Green Neal will be discussing her experience in Turkmenistan, and it sounds quite intriguing. So if you need more information about that, please contact Ellen Shiner, who has been organizing our lyceums and doing a fabulous job. And here is another announcement. There is a discussion series that is starting, Uncomfortable Conversations About Race. And here is the announcement. Our country is facing many difficult challenges, and among these are deep racial divisions and disparities. We invite all parish members to join us in a short discussion series in a safe, confidential, and supportive Zoom space where each of us can openly explore how racism impacts our lives and everyday actions and find ways to make changes now to address this important issue. These sessions, led by Lois Pulliam and Sylvia Cowan, will be based on the book, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man, by Emmanuel Akko, and accompanying video conversations from his YouTube channel. For more information, please log into the introductory session on Tuesday night, February 1st, from 7 p.m. to 7.45 p.m. via Zoom. Further details are in the parishioner and in the Anno list. So check that out, stay tuned, spread the word to anyone who may be interested in these important conversations with gratitude to our facilitators. 
And with that, I will turn it over to Lisa Maria, leading our Time for All Ages from her home on Zoom. Before we do the Time for All Ages, I would like to invite um, everybody to join in our unison affirmation. And I will do my best with my Spanish pronunciation for the second part. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another. El amor es el espíritu de esta iglesia y el servicio es su ley. Este es nuestro gran pacto, vivir juntos en paz, buscar la verdad en el amor e ayudarnos los unos a los otros. For those of you who have not met my daughter, this is my daughter Viviana. And my son Vinny is also here for our story today. And our story today is about the Buddha, his cousin Devadatta, and an elephant. Now, if you've never heard of the Buddha, the Buddha was a wise, kind, good person who lived about 2,500 years ago. He was a teacher who encouraged people to live peacefully and mindfully with generosity and care for all. Now, this story is about Buddha's cousin, Devadatta, who was super, super jealous of him, really jealous. And Devadatta felt that he himself was as good as Buddha, as kind as Buddha, and as smart as Buddha. And he didn't understand why all of these students would go to Buddha when he was just as good. And he was really jealous that these people would ignore him and didn't honor him and respect him the way they treated the Buddha. Because he was so jealous and so mad that it wasn't honored in the same way, he grew angrier and angrier. And the angrier that he got, he would start to think up ways to hurt Buddha. Now, one day he thought of a plot to actually kill Buddha. Not just hurt him, but like unalive him. Now, he knew that on a certain day, Buddha was going to be coming through on a visit to a particular town. And so before the Buddha came into the town, he brought an elephant to the town and he hid it beside a wall. And then he fed the elephant a lot of candy and cookies and cakes to get the elephant all bonkers and zany. <laughs> Now his plan was to make use of this sugared up elephant who had eaten so much sugar, he would like go nuts and trample the Buddha to death. When the jealous Devadatta saw from a distance that the Buddha was coming, he started poking the elephant with a stick to get him even more riled up. And the sugar crazed elephant was annoyed and, and the poking made him angry. And so he started jumping up and down violently. And so seeing this, Devadatta immediately released the elephant towards the Buddha. Now, overwhelmed with anger and pain and pretty much unaware of anything because of all the candy, the elephant just started running at full speed towards the Buddha. It raised its ears and tail and trunk, making a lot of noise. It was as if thunder was striking. Now, all of the students who were traveling with Buddha were horrified at this terrible sight, and they scrambled to run and flee from harm's way. Only Ananda, Buddha's best friend and attendant, stood firmly beside the Buddha. And at that time, Buddha himself remained totally at ease, calm, composed. He took a look at the elephant and felt great love and compassion for the poor beast. He stood where he was and radiated his loving kindness towards the elephant. Buddha's love and compassion were so strong and so powerful that the elephant could feel it. And just a few steps before about to charge into the Buddha, the elephant stopped in its path and calmed down. It then gently trotted towards Buddha and respectfully bowed its head. Buddha stroked the elephant's trunk and comforted it with soft and kind words. The elephant was completely and totally 
tamed. I thank you all for listening to our story. And just a reminder for those who will be joining Children's Chapter after Joys and Concerns, please change your name to CC your name so we can get you into the breakout room. Thank you all for listening. This morning's reading is from Anger, Wisdom for Cooling the Flames by Thich Nhat Hanh. This is from a section called, You Can Make It Through the Storm. Strong emotions are like a storm, and to stand in the middle of a storm is very dangerous. Yet, that is what most of us do when we stay in our minds, letting our feelings overwhelm us. Instead, we have to get rooted by bringing our attention downward. We focus on our abdomen and practice mindful breathing, just giving all of our attention to its rise and fall. When you look at a tree in a storm, you see that the top of the tree is very unstable and vulnerable. The wind can break the smaller branches at any time. But when you look down to the trunk of the tree, you have a different impression. You see that the tree is very solid and still, and you know it is able to withstand the storm. We are also like a tree. Our head is the top of the tree during a tempest of strong emotion, so we have to bring our attention down to the level of our navel. We begin to practice mindful breathing. We concentrate just on our breathing and the rise and fall of our abdomen. It is a very important practice because it helps us to see that, although an emotion may be very strong, it will stay only for a while and then go. It cannot last forever. If you train yourself to practice like this during difficult times, you will survive these storms. And there ends the reading. But now I want to tell you a little bit about our Share the Plate this morning because this morning um, though it is not technically the first Sunday, we are still doing our Share the Plate for our offering this morning. So our Share the Plate is going to the International Institute in, of New England. And this was actually our designated recipient back in October for Share the Plate, so if it sounds repetitive, that would be why, but um, there was just a mix-up along the way, and actually that share the plate ended up going to the Greater Boston Food Bank. Now that's a good thing because people really need food and we're glad we gave money to the food bank, but that was not who we meant to give it to, so we're trying again with the International Institute of New England. This organization is uh, definitely involved in the work of settlement for new Afghani refugees as well as other uh, endeavors, and so it is an important organization uh, in line with our values, and I do encourage you to give generously, both for the work of this church and for the work of this organization this morning in Sunday's offering. 
And as always, you can give online by going to uubedford.org slash donate or finding the donate button on our website. Your offering will be generous, well, your generous offering will be gratefully received. So how are you? <clears throat> Before I get started with my sermon this week, I want to ask you that question. How are you holding up? I so wish that you were here in person with me and Annie and Sandra and Brad and everyone else who was helping us out in the back to tell us in person how you are. Once again, you may see that I'm wearing my chicken stole with its reference to the passage from the Gospel of Matthew. It says, as a hen gathers her chicks, so I long to gather you. Of course, for those of you who are very familiar with that passage, you may remember that in Matthew, the problem is that the people are not willing to be gathered. But that is not our situation here. here it is the freaking pandemic. Once again, the Omicron spike, 26,000 or so confirmed cases a day right now in Massachusetts alone. And so for a few more weeks or maybe a month or so until this surge peaks and declines, this is our situation. Though I do wanna take a moment to thank the generous, kind-hearted soul who placed some of the cardboard figurines in the sanctuary pews so that we are not speaking to quite as empty a house. Thank you for that. But all in all, the situation in which we find ourselves is frustrating, it's maddening, it's irksome, it's irritating, it's sad and isolating and lonely making, but it's also temporary. As I said to a few people this week, 
it feels like we may need to prepare ourselves for not one new normal, but two versions of new normal going forward. The spring, summer, and fall new normal, and the winter new normal, when surges like this will likely surge. But we shall see. We do not know. None of us know. Still, I find some comfort in the knowledge that at least this surge, too, will pass. But the thing that's really been on my mind this week a lot is January 6th, AKA the one year anniversary of what some of us would call an insurrection or an attempted coup and which some others in the country continue to refer to as just a group of tourists visiting the capital. I don't know about you, but this past week in relation to that event, I was feeling many strong, feelings. In the days leading up to Thursday's anniversary, I was feeling a sense of foreboding. I heard from some others of you in person and online that you might have been feeling that sense of foreboding too. Whenever I think about what happened last year, when I see the news coverage or I watch the video footage, I feel some pretty strong anger. What bothers me most? Is it the lying or the gaslighting or the ignorance or the hypocrisy or the cruelty? I can honestly not decide. And when I read or think about the future, the strategic authoritarian, authoritarian styled endgame that's being conceived, the ways in which the so-called big lie continues to inspire anti-democratic and uncivil activities and actions around this country, I feel a potent mix of dread and fear. It, especially in combination with the pandemic surge and honestly the occasional hot flash and the immovable 20 pound dog who sleeps with us and pushes me to the edge of the bed each night, all of these things together can literally wake me up in the middle of the night and keep me lying awake feeling strong feelings. At some point this week, in the dead of night, tossing and turning and trying to get back to sleep, I had the realization that my mind was behaving not unlike the elephant in that story that Lisa Maria told us this morning, traumatized and triggered, poked and prodded, because someone else, angry, jealous, and spiteful, had managed to prod and poke my mind into a state of pain and rage, and I had allowed that to happen. And I lay there thinking, if I didn't figure out a way to stop this angry, raging elephant of my mind, I would uh, be threatened by it, that it would become a threat to my mental and spiritual and eventually physical well-being as well. And I realized I did not want to continue week after week living that way, sleeplessly, with my mind running and raging, waking me up at three in the morning, and I imagine you don't either. I would much rather be like the Buddha in that story for whom I have profound admiration. And so one early morning, lying awake, I was thinking about how it might be time once again to begin to be intentional again about reclaiming my capacity for standing still in the midst of such emotional turbulence. I find that sort of reclamation is something that I need to do periodically so that I can try to be, in the words of the great Stoic Marcus Aurelius, like the cliff against which the waves continually break, but it stands firm and tames the fury of the water around it. And so, lying there that morning, I thought of the story that Lisa Maria shared of the Buddha taming the mad elephant. As an aside, it's actually not unusual for me to think about elephants at this time of year. We have at home this nativity set on our mantle 
that we put up each Christmas time. It's a Fisher Price nativity set that one of my old senior high youth advisors from the United Methodist Church sent to me many years ago when she found out that I had had a baby, that Kathy and I were going to be moms, or were moms. And we've been putting it up as a Christmas decoration during Advent ever since. My daughter, who is now 13 and a half, grew up with it. But over time, the angel and the shepherds and the Mary and the Joseph and the baby and the donkeys and the camels and the sheep from this nativity set have gotten mixed up with some of the Fisher Price Noah's Ark animals. And so it's not uncommon in our household at Christmas time for us to also have giraffes and hippos and bears and yes, elephants lined up to see the baby lying in the manger. And I should also add, as long as we're talking about elephants, that our two dogs, our 100 pound Labrador retriever and our 20 pound aforementioned cockapoo, get a stuffed pig and a stuffed elephant in their stockings every year. The very same model of stuffed pig and stuffed elephant, because they are of a brand advertised to be tough and durable, and because Santa keeps falling for that marketing, and because in any case the dog seems so much to love them. And so every year they are excited to see a brand new pig and a brand new elephant in their stockings, and they stay joyfully occupied with them while we are opening up our stockings and our presents. And by the end of the first, let's say, hour, both the super tough pig and the super tough elephant have been breached. And by the end of the first day, most of their stuffing is all over the floor. And by day three or so, we have to actually cut out the squeakers so they can't get to them. But they continue to carry the pig and elephant carcasses around with them quite joyfully, and they sometimes sleep with them. And every time we go out in the yard, they try to take them outside. And I stand at the door for this whole period of time each year and say to one dog or the other, okay, you can take it out, but you have to bring it back in. And so every single one of the 12 days of Christmas, the same scene plays out where one dog carries out the skin of an elephant and drops it in the yard and does her business and starts to come, out, come inside. And I find myself there in the yard alone, yelling, get the Ellie, get the Ellie, get the elephant, elephant. Usually they've run in, but they turn around and come back out and get the elephant. And so by epiphany, when the baby Jesus is, according to the story, receiving the very finest of gifts from the Magi, the gold and the frankincense and the myrrh, my dogs are perpetually bringing me this back into the house and then back out again. But I digress. I don't have a big pulpit to put this on. I don't want to put it on the piano. That's probably not. I can put it on the piano? All right. So that's elephants. In the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, the elephant is an important figure. The elephant represents the human mind. And like an untamed elephant, the untrained mind can be difficult to control. When the Tibetan teacher Lama Chodrak Rinpoche prepares for his own meditation sessions, he says, holding the rope of mindfulness and the hook of alertness, may I resolve to tame this mind, which is like a wild elephant. 
I periodically need to practice taming my own mind, and maybe you do too. But we don't want to treat our minds in such a way that they end up looking like that, right? We want to learn to tame our minds in the same way that the Buddha tames the mad elephant, with steadfast and compassionate attention. In the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, there is a whole set of meditation instructions on what's called calm abiding or mindfulness, which are often portrayed in the form of a beautiful tapestry which decorates many Tibetan temples. In the tapestry, a man and an elephant and a monkey are shown repeatedly on an ascending road with many, many sharp turns representing the various stages of mindfulness training. The man represents the person who is learning to meditate. The elephant is his mind. The monkey represents distraction, which might be any thought or feeling of a strong nature. In the first scene at the bottom, the monkey is the monkey is leading the elephant, and the man is following far behind with a lasso, trying somewhat frantically to catch up to his own mind. You might say that he has lost his mind and is getting, trying to get it back. In the next scene, the man has lassoed the elephant, who is starting to kind of look back toward the man, although it is still being led forward by the monkey. Eventually, the elephant starts to pay more and more attention to the man than to the monkey, and the monkey falls behind, grasping for the elephant's tail. And then the monkey is left behind completely, and the man has no need for the rope, as the elephant has begun to follow him obediently. In the end, the man rides atop the elephant, whom he has befriended. The elephant has been tamed. My very favorite scene from this whole tapestry is one at the very end, in which the man is sitting down in the grass alongside the elephant who is lying down next to him. They're both on the ground, on the same level, if you will, and they are looking lovingly and with great devotion into the eyes of one another. This is the moment of calm abiding. This is the moment of full presence, and it is a moment filled with compassion, including the man's compassion for his own mind. We too, say the great teachers, can achieve that we too can experience that sense of calm abiding. We too can become like the Buddha from the earlier story, able to stand still and calm while the elephant charges, while the demands of the world crash upon us and thrash around us. We too can remain calm and centered, kind and compassionate toward ourselves and toward others in this present moment. All it takes is intention and practice. But that's not all fun and games. It's not always pleasant or satisfying or immediately gratifying to sit still and meditate, as many of us who have tried know. Pema Chodron, who is another Buddhist teacher in the Tibetan tradition, asks in one of her books, why do we meditate? And then she answers her own question, saying, first of all, it's helpful to understand that meditation is not just about feeling good. To think that this is why we meditate is to set ourselves up for failure. We'll assume that we are doing it wrong every time we sit down. For even the most settled meditator experiences psychological and physical pain, she says, meditation, takes us just as we are with all our confusion and our sanity. This complete acceptance of ourselves, she says, 
as we are, this complete acceptance of ourselves as we are in any given moment is called Maitri, a simple direct relationship with the way things are. She goes on to list four qualities of this way of being that are cultivated when we meditate. They are steadfastness, clear seeing, experiencing our emotional distress, and attention to the present moment. Regarding the first, steadfastness, she says this, when we practice meditation, we are strengthening our ability to be steadfast with ourselves. No matter what comes up, aching bones, boredom, falling asleep, or the wildest thoughts and emotions, we develop a loyalty to our own experience. We don't run screaming out of the room, no matter how much we may want to. Learning to stay with ourselves in meditation, she says, is like training a dog. If we train a dog by beating it, we'll end up with an obedient but inflexible and terrified dog, neurotic and confused. By contrast, training with kindness results in a dog who is flexible and confident, who doesn't become upset when situations are unpredictable or insecure. That is steadfastness, the first of the things that we can cultivate through mindfulness. Developing our capacity to stay with the discomfort of our bodies and our minds. The second quality that we cultivate when we practice mindfulness is clear seeing. We become more honest with ourselves about what we are thinking and what we are feeling in any given moment. Closely connected with that is the third quality that we cultivate, the ability to experience emotional distress. Meditation or mindfulness, says Pema, is not about escaping uncomfortable emotions but about riding the energy of our anger or fear until it begins to dissipate. Recognizing the difficult emotion and acknowledging it, but not trying to repress it or dismiss it, but also not allowing ourselves to get hooked by it. Another Tibetan teacher, Trungpa Rinpoche says, that emotion can't proliferate without our internal conversations. In other words, what he means is we recognize our uncomfortable emotion, but we don't have to give it more oxygen by talking about it, by thinking about it. Feelings can turn into thoughts, which can in turn exacerbate feelings. And so, there is an interconnection between what we're thinking and what we're feeling that's always evolving unless we stop it. And so conversely, another Tibetan teacher says that one of the goals of mindfulness is to catch the thoughts that we notice before they turn into feelings. Don't fan the fire of your feelings so that they grow into thoughts. Catch the thoughts before they become more intense feelings. Which brings us to the final and fourth quality of mind that we can cultivate through mindfulness or meditation, which is, according to Pema, attention to the present moment. Through practice, we cultivate attention, and we cultivate our ability to make the intentional choice to be fully present and also gentle with ourselves. Even when the world around us is chaotic and stormy and upsetting. We cultivate our ability to resist being carried away by our worries, our fears, our cravings, our anger, so that we do not lose ourselves. So, to bring this all full circle, in a few weeks, in early, February, when the January 6th Commission begins to hold its live hearings, which I am both looking forward to and dreading, perhaps even during prime time, how will we be then? 
how will you be then? I know that some of you, like me, will want to watch the coverage. Some of us won't be able to help ourselves, even if we don't think it wise. Perhaps other, others of us will be intentional about not watching or limiting our exposure to them. And that might be the only way that some of us will get through it without losing our elephants completely. But if you do choose to watch and you start to find that your elephant is getting antsy, starting to follow the monkeys of your thoughts or feelings, perhaps you can be intentional about noticing that, especially if you set that intention now. Notice how it feels in your body. Notice your thoughts and your feelings and how they interact with one another. Practice sitting deeper in your elephant saddle. And then maybe you can call your elephant back to you with the deepest compassion when it starts to get out of control. Or to use another image from Thich Nhat Hanh, the one from our reading this morning, you can practice being like a tree and sinking into your roots. Practice allowing yourself to get out of your head, the storminess of your head for a time, where the storm winds of thought toss the branches around unmercifully, and back into your center, back into your body, into this very precious moment. In the words of my colleague, Elena Westbrook, in a world ravaged by violence, by hatred, by conflicts that seem eternal and insoluble, sometimes the only thing we can do is to be still for a moment to remind ourselves of what is real. The sun that rose this morning, the dirt under our feet, the air whispering in and out of our lungs. This hour, she says, just try to be present in every moment as it unfolds. Your simple attention is what makes these moments holy. May it be so for you, may it be so for me. Amen and blessed be. Now go forth in simplicity, find and walk the path that leads to compassion and wisdom, that leads to happiness and peace and ease. Welcome the stranger and open your heart to a world in need of healing. Be courageous before the forces of hate. Hold and embody a vision of the common good that serves the needs of all people. Go in peace and return again in peace. Amen. <laughs>